Let's switch off the race waiting room now. So we will just come in. Come in straight or? Yeah. 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 Are you ready? Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mandy Topkin. Um, I'd like to just give people a few minutes to join. Uh, we've got about 126 people already on out of 400 that have registered. Uh, I think we'll start in about a minute. Um, so if you could, I'm just going to mute myself for another minute and then I'll come back and we'll start the webinar. Thank you. Right, I think we've given uh, people enough time to join. I'd like to welcome you all to um, probably the quickest webinar and the most influential webinar that Lucille has put together for rabies. All I did was give her a suggestion and before I knew it, we had uh, eight or nine of the most uh, prestigious speakers in the country talking on rabies and what a wonderful one health prevention of rabies outbreak response you've got here Lucille you've got vets and doctors and nurses and everybody so uh, uh, Professor Lucille Bloomberg uh, from the NICD and the Faculty of uh, Veterinary Science in the University of Pretoria um, is uh, as you all know um, the draw card for many of our um, CMEs that we have on infectious diseases, especially rabies and malaria. And we thought in light of the latest rabies uh, um, outbreak in horses in Swart Corps in, in the Cape, not Swart Corps in Pretoria, sorry Mida, I uh, told you it was in Pretoria that we'd put this quick uh, webinar together. Um, and um, I think um, Lucille will introduce the speakers. We did not want to go with bios that were 54 pages long because I think you know them all. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, share my screen. Um, in two seconds, we'll share my screen um, and see if you can see it. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Is it not coming up? No. Okay, now? Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's the rabies webinar, One Health Prevention of Rabies and Outbreak and uh, and an Outbreak Response. Um, and if you if you have a look at um, I'm not sure why it doesn't want to move forward. The speakers, Lucille will introduce the speakers as they go through their sessions. Um, right. There you go, Lucille. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for joining tonight. Special thanks to Mandy for putting this together in uh, record time, and a huge thanks to the invited speakers. Um, every one of you is an expert in rabies, passionate about rabies. I think you can speak for hours on it, and I'm going to apologize in advance um, for limiting um, the times this evening. We've got a lot to cover. So thank you to all of you for agreeing so quickly to be part of this. Um, as, as Mandy mentioned, it was prompted by the cases on the West Rand, some horse cases that had preceded this, and then the increase in cases of rabies in KwaZulu-Natal, both in animals and also the human cases. 
So during COVID, um, rabies control has been uh, adversely affected. People are not taking their dogs to be vaccinated. COVID has affected the animal campaigns, particularly in um, KwaZulu-Natal, and uh, Kevin LaRue can attest to some of the, the real difficulties in getting the teams out there. Many of them have been um, moved to COVID activities, lots of security incidents, and um, animal coverage there for dog vaccinations is quite low. I think also people who are bitten or exposed to potentially rabid animals because of COVID may not seek care for what seem to be relatively minor exposures. They're afraid to go to hospitals. Um, COVID has really affected our health systems uh, very widely. So I think we can expect to see uh, further human cases. So I think without further ado, I think I'm gonna move into the program. Um, please type your questions in the chat and we'll try and address them. Probably at the end, I think most of the questions will be addressed during the talks. Um, we don't have, I'm not sure about CPD points, um, and we'll we'll talk about that that afterwards. Maybe Mandy can respond to that. We, we, de we definitely have CPD points, I don't think about it, and that's why everyone's had to register. That's correct. Fantastic. Yeah. So that's and it will, yeah, thanks. And a, a true One Health Forum, which is uh, really what rabies response and prevention needs to be. So the first speakers are Dr. Mariana Corza, who's a public health registrar from WITS, who's rotating through NICD, she does human health, and Dr. Nomfundiso Gamedi, who's a vet, and also one of our field epidemiology training program residents. And they've been intimately involved in responding uh, to the current outbreak in the Western uh, part of Gauteng, together with our state vet and uh, communicable disease people on the ground. So over to you, uh, Mariana and uh, Nomfundiso. Thanks very much. Mariana, you can start. Mariana, are you still there? Struggling to unmute. Okay. Nomfandiso, do you want to start with the outbreak? And you can pre present and Mariana can take over. Okay, not a problem. You'll just have to skip through the slides though, they were at the beginning. If you, if you can, no, no, uh -uh, don't, don't skip over anything. Mm -hmm. Just start, you know the outbreak and you can present it. Okay. Mariana can just pick up if she joins, otherwise she can just answer questions. Thanks, okay. Nanfandisa. Not a problem. Okay, we're good to go. Um, we can go to the first slide, please. So, <clears throat> sorry, Katja, if you'll do me a favor while I'm presenting, can you uh, give Mariana co-host or let her un unmute, please? She seems to have a problem there. Okay, okay. maybe that's the problem. Yeah. Okay, we should have joined her before. Mariana, are you on? I think we need some help, Mandy. Lucille, she said in the chat that she's battling to unmute. Yeah, but she's on. There she yes. is. Hi, okay. everyone. Okay, wonderful. I am finally here. My deepest apologies. Um, and happy to start. I do not have control of the screen, so no, Pindi, so if you don't mind just going to the first um, slide as well. Or whoever might be controlling the screen, please. I'm controlling the screen for you. I'm on the first slide. Can you see it? Oh, okay, thanks. Do you mind going to the very first one? Just the cover. To go backwards to the cover. There you go. Thank you. And um, good evening, everyone. Um, 
my apologies for the bit of a shaky start. I'll be presenting as well as Nofundra on the current rabies outbreak that's happening in the West Strand in a small town um, called Crom Dry. And this is just a picture that we took from there, just to give you an idea of what the town setup is like. Um, second slide, please. Mandy, yeah. All right, thank you. And so on the 14th of June, um, rabies was confirmed in Two Jackal from the Rhino and Lion Park. I'm sure some of you may have seen it in the news. And this is in the West Strand. And um, during that same period, um, there were three other jackal that were suspected of having rabies. And then um, later on, on the 29th of July, there, were, um, there was a report of two women who had been attacked by a honey badger in the Chrome Dry area, also in Mokhale City. The honey badger, um, was then also linked to an earlier attack of an another woman who had been walking on the road carrying her baby. And that honey badger was actually confirmed to have rabies as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. And this is just giving you, this is a map overview of the area. Um, this is the West Strand and um, you can see there, um, it's the cradle of humankind um, that's, where you find it and you see it, it's um, there's a blue square there. Um, and commonly there's been outbreaks and Ofunda will um, let you, will tell you about these. In this area, um, in the Mulder's Drift area, in um, Mohale City area, and because of most of the outbreaks that usually happen in the Northwest, and you can see how this district um, is quite in close proximity to the Northwest. And I think the other speakers will actually um, expand further on this in terms of the animals rabies that are seen there and that kind of spills over to the district. Next slide, please. All right, and this is just a, um, kind of a zoomed in um, view of the district itself and the current rabies outbreak. At the moment, um, as you can see, we've had um, three confirmed um, animal cases and we've had three human exposures. We haven't had any confirmed human cases. And as the talk will, um, with the proceedings of the talk today, um, we'll see that rabies is a preventable disease and we actually don't want to have any confirmed human cases. So um, we, also don't really want to have exposed human case, um, any human exposures, but if we do, we can prevent human rabies. Next slide, please. Thank you. And this is a table um, with the three human exposures. And this is just a, um, an explanation of the th three human exposures that I have. Um, the first one actually is, um, the human exposure number three. So please forgive, forgive it on the table where um, the first one's the 87 year old lady. And I'll explain why the first one is listed as number three. It's just that the, the, um, the woman was found later on because she had actually been exposed to um, the honey badger who was later confirmed to, which was later confirmed to um, have rabies. And this was a lady who was walking home um, carrying her child on her back when this um, honey badger, which she describes as, you know, what she thought was a monkey, came and it just attacked her out of nowhere as she was walking home. And so um, she presented to um, the local clinic and it's only once the surveillance officer, when they were doing their follow-ups that they realized that, oh no, she may have been exposed to rabies and um, that we managed to find her um, afterwards and give her the PIP. In fact, um, the same honey badger, um, probably around the same time or within that in a short period of time was then connected to two other exposures. So then it's that um, first, the first lady who was, who was an 87 year old female who was um, at home hanging her washing um, and this honey badger just came into her yard and just started attacking her completely un unprovoked and it mauled her and, you know, it caused um, avulsion injuries. Um, it attacked her head, her chest, um, it attacked her limbs. At this point in time, her neighbor, which is um, the second exposure, which is a 32 year old female, was seeing her um, being attacked. And so she went over to try and help the lady. And during, um, 
during you know that whole commotion of trying to at least assist the lady and get the honey badger off the 87 year old and um, the 32 year old also sustained um, injuries to her leg although they were minor all three exposures though were category three exposures according as per um, the WHO categories and um, they all needed post-exposure prophylaxis with um, rabies immunoglobulin. They all did receive this but they um, were however delayed um, by 72 hours. Um, the lady actually who's 87 she received um, her rabies immunoglobulin in theater because her injuries were so extensive that she needed um, to, she needed severe, she needed um, debridement. Um, and so um, she received her rabies immunoglobulin and her vaccine under sedation in theater. Unfortunately, though, um, three days later, she did pass away from a myocardial, um, myocardial, uh, myocardial infarct, excuse me. Um, and yeah, so unfortunately, she also had um, septic wounds. So she did not die from rabies itself. Um, she died from a myocardial infarct, probably because of um, uh, um, comorbidities that she had, plus the new injuries that she had. Next slide, please. The other two exposures are doing well. And this is just a brief overview of what we've done um, since the outbreak has started. In terms of the outbreak response, um, we've set up an outbreak response team at the NICD. Um, we're using a one health approach. So we've got veterinarians, epidemiologists, virologists, and clinicians, and we meet, um, we meet daily and we follow up on any cases that have been reported. We use zero reporting. We make sure that we contact all the health facilities. We contact the CDC um, office surveillance officers from the district to make sure that, you know, any new bites or any um, animals that may be rabid or suspected of being rabid are reported and we can follow up on them and make sure that um, we can decrease the amount of exposures as possible. And so um, we also did a field visit um, last week where we went and spoke with the local clinic staff just to find out where there may be gaps and challenges. We found that they don't, didn't have a bite register, for instance, and we're assisting with that. But we also really were happy to find like there were opportunities there. For instance, the sister, um, the main um, manager of the clinic is very well experienced in rabies. She worked with rabies in Zimbabwe when she still lived in Zimbabwe. And um, so she's able to educate her staff quite nicely. And the other things is that they use the Warbot system. So they're using community health workers to spread the information about rabies. In this area, because they don't have, um, you know, a lot of, they don't have a local radio station um, and they don't have a local newspaper. So word of mouth is really the main way to do the public awareness campaign. And um, with posters and stuff. But um, for the greater area, we have been using um, TV and radio interviews, social media, just to get the word out there and make sure that people are aware that there is a rabies um, outbreak in the area and they can get their dogs vaccinated. And Nomfundo is going to take over and tell you about the mass dogs, dog vaccination campaign that's also happening um, in the area. But also so that if people are, um, think they may have been exposed, they can um, you know, present promptly to their healthcare facility so that they can get post exposure prophylaxis. Okay, so that's where I stop and Nomfundo is going to take over and just let you know about the mass dog vaccination campaign that's been happening in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. Okay, so since the, the first report of the confirmed um, rabies cases, mass dog and cat vaccinations have been conducted in the cradle of humankind area as well as surrounding areas and to date we have vaccinated just over 2500 dogs and cats in the area next slide please okay so some of the challenges um, that have come about with having mass vaccinations in, in an area such as the cradle of humankind where the area is very rural and it is a very um, big area that we had to cover. The first challenge is that we do not know the exact number of dogs and cats in the area. And therefore we are not really able to measure whether we are reaching the 70% um, vaccination coverage target. However, to try and combat that, what has happened is that in addition to having the mass vaccination campaigns at certain points, 
the campaigns have now moved to a more door-to-door -door approach so that those animals which were not able to come to the vaccination points are, are still covered. Another challenge that has come with working in such an area is the high numbers of wildlife and livestock in the area. And it is just not as simple to vaccinate these species as it is with our dogs and cats. But I'm sure um, our colleagues will expand on that. Next slide, please. Okay, so just looking at some of the previous outbreaks that have occurred in Gauteng, um, as Mariana pointed out, Gauteng is not a, a typical area where rabies um, outbreaks occur. So when they do occur, it is something quite special. So there was an outbreak in 2010, which is focused in the southwestern part of Johannesburg. So that includes Soweto. And this involved an extensive outbreak in domestic dogs. Fortunately, there was only one human case, and upon investigation, it was found that the rabies was imported um, from KZN. And fortunately, we were able to, this outbreak was controlled by mass dog vaccinations in the area. Next slide, please. Okay, and then there was another outbreak um, in 2016 in the very area that we have an outbreak now, which is Mohale City. And this outbreak included 38 positive animal cases with jackal being the most common species affected. And then fortunately in this outbreak, there were no human cases, even though there were several human exposures. So this just reflects the point that um, post-exposure prophylaxis was done adequately. Next slide, please. Okay, and then um, looking outside our area, which we are currently looking at, we early this week, we received notification of confirmed um, rabies cases in two horses in the Eastern Cape. So even though this happened outside our area, it's quite important that we still keep our ears and eyes open to see what is happening <clears throat> in the rest of the country. So with these two, two cases that were confirmed, there were human exposures. However, they are receiving the appropriate post-exposure prophylaxis. And then unfortunately, I also received a message just before we started with this webinar that there's an additional confirmed case in a pet dog um, in the Tarleton area, which is very close to the cradle of humankind. So at this point, investigations are still going on, but um, there have been no human exposures. However, it was reported that there are multiple dogs um, on the property. So by the look of things, it, it doesn't look like we are quite at the end of this outbreak yet. So thank you for your time. That is the end of my presentation. So um, thanks very much for setting the scene. Um, thanks uh, uh, to both of you. Good one health collaboration. Just to mention that um, uh, both human cases um, attacked by the honey badger in that in on the plot um, were managed at uh, emergency department. Uh, and both received appropriate post-exposure prophylaxis. Jacques Tatoy is on the webinar, and I remember discussing it with him, um, and he uh, very diligently and uh, expertly administered um, rabies immune globulin to um, the lady who was mauled. She was then referred to, to theater at another hospital and uh, required extensive uh, debridement. So thanks very much, uh, Jacques. I think we're gonna move on now to, um, look at rabies in animals. We're gonna look at uh, um, recognition of rabies in animals. And I think the vets are very familiar. We're gonna look at some of the uh, rabies in other parts of the country, and then also vaccination of animals. I think many of you are familiar with dogs, but what can we do for livestock and, and, and wildlife? So we're gonna have uh, Kevin LaRue, who I know is very busy with a foot and mouth uh, outbreak in KZN. So thanks very much, Kevin, just uh, 
uh, for sharing your expertise. Kevin is a passionate rabies practitioner. Um, and then we'll move on to Dr. Didi Klaassen, uh, who's uh, a vet working with AfriVet, and then to, to Dr. Katja Kuppel, um, who's at University of Pretoria Faculty of Veterinary Science. So over to you, um, Kevin, first. Thanks. Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, I've only, I think I've only got three slides here just to talk briefly about what's happening in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, Lucille mentioned earlier that we've had a lot of security problems with hijackings. We've had COVID, obviously. We now have foot and mouth um, and a number of other problems as well in, um, in the veterinary side. So KwaZulu-Natal is in a very, very serious predicament right now um, with multiple veterinary diseases breaking out and spreading rapidly. And unfortunately, over the last three years, rabies has taken a massive knock. Um, we were experiencing huge numbers of vehicles being hijacked, which basically stopped most of our mass vaccination campaigns. Um, we then have COVID, which obviously stopped most of our mass interventions as well. Um, we talk in the region of about 450,000 vaccinations a year um, for KZN, um, going up to 650, depending on, on what is happening. Um, the two maps that you see in front of you just show you 2020, um, where the, the, most of the cases are situated. You can see them in red there. And then in 2021, it's continued with much the same pattern, as you can see, but by August this year, we have the same number of cases as we had last year. And we're expecting this to double by the end of the year. And there is a marked inland movement of late. So it's normally a coastal belt thing, which follows where the large settlements of people are on the docks. But it is moving inland. And we've had six human deaths already. Um, again, COVID has affected that quite badly because half of those deaths are not confirmed. So we're not getting the laboratory results. We're not getting the samples, probably because of the pressures from the health department with actual testing. So if we can go to the next slide. This is just a historical look from 2000 to, to date, what's happening in KwaZulu-Natal. The blue line on top represents the vaccinations, um, which peaked in 2012 after a, a massive outbreak. And we basically smashed the disease. We reduced it by 93%, stopped all human deaths. But since 2012, there's been a steady decline, lack of support um, for our teams, and then the multiple complications over the last three, four years with, with security problems in KwaZulu-Natal and our vaccinations have absolutely plummeted and they are continuing to um, go down. And so the future is very bleak for KZN. That red line uh, arrow at the end is the predicted total by the end of this year. And whenever we've got a massive increase like that, we're gonna have um, a subsequent increase in human cases. It's just, that's how it works. Increase in dog cases, increased in human cases. If we can go to the next slide. Um, let's just show you the pretty steep in, uh, way in which the disease is increasing. And you can see at the bottom, we get to a certain point and the human cases start um, just increasing as well. The, the problem being with COVID now, there we believe that a lot of uh, human cases are probably being missed uh, due to the incredible pressures on the, the health system. So we could have, we could quite easily have double that number of people having died and, and some of them we don't even know about. And most of these now are probable cases, not confirmed. So the, the future in KwaZulu-Natal looks pretty bleak. Um, as Lucille mentioned, we have a foot and mouth outbreak that has taken all of the veterinary service people away to work with the cattle and try and stop that disease, which is an international disaster according to the OIE, and that leaves rabies exposed. Uh, amongst that, we also have massive outbreaks of avian influenza, um, brucellosis, even tuberculosis is starting in the cattle now. And I think we have just over 200 people to try and deal with all of that and vaccinate this 400 to 500,000 dogs. 
which unfortunately is not going to happen. So the the threat to it's KZN is a threat to most of the country. Actually, we export the, this, this disease. It moves as fast as somebody moving a dog with a car to Gauteng because they found it um, at their aunt's house. Um, it moves between KwaZulu-Natal and Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape is having a similarly tough time. We believe that um, things are really um, a huge problem there. There's been a massive outbreak in Port Elizabeth and East London. Um, those, those populations have reached the point where now where they can sustain huge outbreaks. So the outlook, I believe, for, for much of South Africa is bleak. Um, yeah, we can leave it there and there can be questions later. Thanks very much, Kevin. Gosh, uh, yeah, not, a, not an easy time to be there. So let's, let's move on and we can always come back to the questions. We'll move on to Deddy and uh, we'll move straight on um, to Katya after that. So there may be a little bit of overlap and I'll ask the speakers just to skip over the, the overlap areas. And uh, uh, over to you, Deddy. Thanks, Lucille. So um, next slide, please, thanks. Um, just an overview of the species affected. So any mammal is technically susceptible to rabies and um, dogs are our biggest concern. I always wanna add cats because dogs and cats live within our homes and they sleep in some people's beds, they share plates. Um, we live very closely to these two, close together with these two species. So um, that's why our government focuses our vaccination drives on these two species, um, just because they create a buffer by having them vaccinated. They create a buffer between humans and the wildlife population, because as uh, Nomfundiso said, we can't vaccinate all the wildlife. We can try, but we're not going to be successful. But what we can do successfully is vaccinate our dogs and cats and then peacefully live with them, um, share our beds, etc., whichever you prefer. And then the problem with rabies is, um, as in humans, the incubation period varies quite a lot um, from being exposed to showing symptoms. And that's why vaccination is so important in vaccination history. And next slide, please. Your slide is up. Didi, you've disappeared. Have I disappeared? I'm here. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, please yeah, continue. You're back. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Sorry. Might be internet. So uh, we have a canine cycle. And um, basically, this is between dogs, bat -jet foxes, and black backed jackal. They can, the virus can circulate between dogs themselves or between these two species, and it does so successfully. Next slide, please. The second one or the second cycle is the mongoose cycle. And the three typical species in this group is the yellow mongoose, the surrogates, and the slender mongoose. And the same, it can cycle between these three species. So what happens from there is we have incidental hosts. So this is where cat comes in, cattle, sheep, horses, and people. And then with the surrogate or the mongoose cycle, it can also affect dogs. So just typical symptoms, I always say <laughs> rabies doesn't read textbooks. So our symptoms can vary quite a bit, um, but the main thing to remember is changed behavior. And it will usually mimic other, it can mimic other diseases. Um, can we just go back, thanks. Um, it can mimic other diseases, um, but there will always be a neurological component. So in dogs, um, they can in attack inanimate objects. Uh, they have a very characteristic howl when they are affected, they can be restless, aggressive. Um, a scary thing that they do present with is a bone stuck in their throat or between in their upper jaw. And then you try and take it out and you get exposed to rabies and muscle spasms, hypersalivation, which is a common symptom in all species. And um, cats can become very aggressive. Um, they bite and sometimes, and it's quite common, we've had several cases where cats bit the person, a rabbit cat, and then they don't release. So the person comes to ER with the cat attached to their arm, um, or the people have to shoot the animal off the animal, off the human. And then sometimes cats can become very affectionate or overly affectionate, they can purr. So that's why I say change behavior is a very vital sign to look for. And um, cattle, um, it can be various animals in the herd that's affected, not just a single animal. They also have that bone and throat or choking um, symptoms. So people try and remove it. 
um, and then they can get exposed. Um, they knuckle over on their fetlocks. They also have a horse bellow that they can give and also quite aggressive. So things to look out for. In sheep, um, they bleed incessantly. So that vocalization is a common symptom in most species. They grind their teeth and they can become hypersexual. So things to look out for. And then wildlife, um, that is on the next slide. They usually lose their fear of man. They don't necessarily become ta tame. I know a lot of people say um, tame animals become wild and wild animals become tame. And they can still be aggressive, but they're not scared of people anymore. So that's why they will approach you and they can attack you like what the honey badger did. You can move on to the next slide. Thanks. Okay, so other incidental hosts, like what we could see now in Gauteng as well, um, goats, donkeys, pigs, lion, hyena, artwolf, wild dogs, um, honey badgers, civet cat, African wild cat, small spotted gen and cape fox, antelope, especially kudu, and especially in Namibia, and then other mongoose species, but basically any mammal is susceptible. Um, I just want to move on to the next slide. So distribution patterns, just with the species that you can keep it in mind, is the northern part of the country, Limpopo is more black-backed jackal. Um, Natal and the eastern parts of the Free State is more the dog version. And then the central parts is mongooses, so that would include Gauteng. And then towards the western parts, we have our bat-eared foxes. So Gauteng sits in the middle and you can be affected by various things. And just to tie in with what Kevin said, um, either it's going to be jackal um, outbreaks spilling over into Gauteng from the western side or people, holiday goers, importing it from various parts that are affected. So we should always, it's not such a big crisis in Gauteng and that lulls us into passivity, but we should always be on the lookout. So I say to students, whenever I lecture on rabies, rabies should always be on your DD list in South Africa. And we can skip the rest of the slides because I think Claude is going to cover that. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Didi. Um, just to mention that the honey badger that attacked the two women uh, was very aggressive. I mean, they're aggressive generally, um, but the neighbor described um, it as, you know, she just couldn't get rid of that honey badger. She took a dustbin lid and tried to hit it. Uh, she took a big stick and tried to pull it off. And then she called her husband who brought a shotgun and it required eight bullets to, to down that animal. Um, so, yeah, it was really, really a very difficult situation. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, yeah, Katya, uh, on to you and rabies and black back jackals and oral bait vaccine. And what can we do for vaccination of um, wildlife? And um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about horses and, and livestock as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, Lucille, can I, I think you've got the big presentation. Can I just send you the other one I have or can I quickly share it? Because I think this one's got too many text in it. Can I share screen, please? I think just share okay. the screen. Mandy can give you sharing rights. I think that's easier. That easiest, okay. Yeah, and you can show your own, best to show your own slides. Yeah, no, it might be, yeah. just might be easier for me. Yeah, thank you. Me two seconds. I have it open. Okay, should be able to see the screen now. Yeah, perfect. All right, that's a bit shorter. And the list you've seen, that's basically the list of species affected. And I'm not going to repeat it. The drivers, as you've all said, is the domestic dog with the highest amount of cases. Um, and wildlife has a very substantial list of cases with yellow mongoose, art wolf, bat-eared fox, and black back jackal being the main drivers in South Africa. And um, just to add, there has been a couple of avian cases, but they are dead in hosts. They, they do not uh, really affect it. But it's something to keep in mind if you're picking up a dead chicken that has been attacked by a jackal, that it could be potentially have rabies. Um, these are the cases, and I think that's mimicking Kevin's quite nicely. We're seeing the 2020 an increase in the caseload of total and overall, as well as a sort of canine increase. And I'm expecting that uh, livestock and wildlife will increase in 2021 with the current outbreaks as we've discussed previously. 
Um, this list, uh, I think this picture we've already seen from Didi where we've seen the different species and what's affected in the different species. But this is a 2016 outbreak of uh, rabies in jackal in the cradle of humankind. And the thing that I wanted to bring back home is the outbreak is in gray. And you can see it very clearly over the eight months where you see the animals were affected. And the blue is the canine cases, the red is the livestock, and the green is the wildlife. And if you look the six months prior, it's most likely that this outbreak was actually coming from a dog case that actually went into the wildlife and then resulted in spread in the blackback jackal causing that massive outbreak. So there's that flow that Didi has already mentioned between the wildlife and um, the rape and the dogs. And it's really important that the dogs are vaccinated again. You can see the cases, the yellow cross is your honey badger. The red outline is your cradle of humankind with the two um, red triangles being the, jack uh, the jackals that are, the and that's also the highest concentration of jackals in the cradle where the current outbreak is. So there we have well over the one um, jackal per kilometer, which is required to spread in rabies. And that's why it's so efficient in spreading in that area. And if you're going to, looking at vaccination, um, I'm going to talk about both vaccination in domestic animals as well as vaccination in wildlife. And in domestic animals, there is four vaccinations available. The Verbag Rabbage and Mono in South Africa is for dogs and cats only, which is an annual repeat, while the Rabison is licensed both in livestock, horses, dogs, and cats. So it's a really, really good vaccination to use in your susceptible livestock species. If the mother has not been vaccinated, then it can be used from four months of age. It needs to be repeated within a year. Um, and if the mother has been vaccinated, they recommend nine months of age to prevent interference with the maternal antibodies. And that one should be used on an annual basis, which means it's a lot of work if you repeat it annually. Um, the Nobivac Rebicin is also licensed in South Africa for livestock on horses, very similar. And um, the good thing is that it only needs to be done every second year. So that's something you can look about if you have got limited um, resources. And the defensor is, lim is for livestock and dogs and cats, um, not licensed in horses. And you need a much higher dosage in livestock to get good antibody titers for rabies. And these are the four vaccines that are licensed for um, livestock and domestic animals. None of them are licensed in wildlife, while, but you could use any of them in wildlife and get good titers. Um, the problem is that it's really difficult to, to actually um, vaccinate your wildlife. And you see the two dead jackals, which were the initial of the outbreak, which were found close to water, which is very common with the jackals. Um, but these are really difficult. So what we've used in the past in Hauteng and what we would like to use more frequently with the rest of South Africa is a bait vaccine. And I've just put it there so you can see the size of it. It's um, oral bait. It's, um, it's uh, called Rabarol VRG. It's made by Burring Ingelheim. It's, it's currently only imported on a research license. But it's based on a vaccine virus with the um, rabies put in um, anti- babies put into the DNA and then res um, resulting in um, antibodies to the rabies and immunity. And the good thing is that it has no risk of everting back to virulence um, because there is no live rabies virus. It's uh, a vaccine virus. And that's been used very successfully in jackals in the area. Um, we've used it in different combinations. So we've used it as its original packaging as well as in meat and chicken, but we've actually found that the jack uh, jackals really, really like the, um, the fish meal base and it's a really good thing for the fish meal base and it's easy to distribute. We've had some kudos eating it as well, as well as honey badgers. So it's something that's well accepted across and the antibody titles are very adequate for about 12 months. Unfortunately, again, as with all the other vaccines, they require quite annual um, use. So using it once off will not work because it's a high turnover of your population and you need to vaccinate the new animals coming into the population. As we said, we want to get something along 70% of vaccination. So it's really important 
that um, that we get this this animals all vaccinated. So if I used on an annual basis, it would be a really good adjuvant to the vaccination of dogs and cats in trying to break the cycle. That is me, my eight minutes. That was perfect, Katya. Um, thanks very much. I think we're going to move on to the human side while Mandy's setting up the video. Can I just ask um, uh, Kevin perhaps about why do we not see rabies in vivid monkeys? We you know, commonly have um, exposures. We know that um, they're mostly provoked. Um, but why are we not? Why do we not see it in vervet monkeys? We see occasionally in, in baboons, but we're not seeing in vervet monkeys. Kevin? That, uh, you had to ask me a very difficult question. I think it's just simply um, the agility of the animals. The source is the dog. Good evening. Um, they compromise the session. Oh, I think she started, so. so. We better just go with it. I'm I'll sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, go back to Kevin. Okay. It's fine. Okay, Kevin. <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay. Um, it's just, I think it's the nature of the animal. Um, a monkey is such an agile animal, and a compromised dog that has rabies, probably relatively sickly, it's going to be very difficult for that dog to actually bite the monkey. I think it's a, it's a simple and mechanical thing that they just don't get to them. And then yeah. if they get rabies, it's possible that they would die somewhere remote and we wouldn't retrieve that, that carcass. Um, okay. We certainly, we've been watching this for many, many years. We've never had a monkey diagnosed. And um, yeah, I, I believe that that's the answer. Maybe somebody else has got another answer. Yeah. No, that, that seems, uh, yeah, I think it fits very well. I think uh, we've had a few baboons. So I think in non-human primates, when this assess the situation, but yeah. Vervets are usually after the baboon food is after also children. more of a land animal. Mm. Um, so you would have baboons in open areas. They could be yeah. somebody could run them down, whereas the monkey will typically stay where there's trees yeah. and can escape easily. Great. Thanks very much. Let's move on to um, a human uh, prevention of rabies. And um, I think we'll go to Jackie's uh, recorded presentation. Uh, thanks very much, Mandy. And sorry, man, uh, Jackie can't be here. She's got a family problem. Good evening. In this session, we will be looking at rabies post exposure prophylaxis for humans. So, what's presented in this session is based on the recommendations of the WHO, which was published in 2018. Note that we are currently in the uh, process of developing national guidelines for rabies post-exposure and pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, that is strongly based on these recommendations by the WHO. So the first course of action when a patient with an animal exposure presents for uh, medical treatment is to assess the risk of rabies exposure. Based on this risk assessment, one would then follow um, the suitable course for management of that particular case. There are three uh, categories that we consider during these uh, risk assessments. Uh, firstly, category one is when there were no direct contact with the animal. Um, this could actually also include um, just being in the presence even of a confirmed rabbit animal, but it may also include, for example, petting or touching an animal where there weren't um, you know, any uh, direct uh, wounds and uh, wounds inflicted, for example. In these cases, we, we don't see any risk for rabies exposure, and one would manage those patients for uh, their wounds. In category two exposures, there were direct contact with, um, with animals, but there were no breach of skin or bleeding. Uh, this could be, for example, when there's bruising or only superficial scratches that did not induce any amount of bleeding. In these patients, one would obviously follow a wind management protocol, but also apply the full course of rabies vaccination. And in the subsequent slides, we will look at the, the schedules for administration of the rabies vaccine. In category three exposures, there were direct contact with animals with a breach of skin, 
any amount of bleeding, could be even really small wounds, doesn't have to be big gaping wounds, but also contact with mucosal membranes. This could be licking of the eyes or the nose. So any contact with broken skin where the saliva, which is of course infect, potentially infected with the rabies virus, can, can infect the body, this, is, this constitutes a possible exposure. In one of the, the other presentations during the session, we will also talk about bat exposures, but bat exposures are also considered category three exposures. In these cases, one would do wound management, the infiltration of rabies immunoglobulin, and the full course of rabies vaccination. And again, in the subsequent slides, we look at the particulars for the administration of these products. In the pictures on the screen, you can see examples of category three exposures. And what I want to point out here is the, the variety of severity of these, of these wounds, even small, um, uh, uh, small wounds like the one you can see here at, at the bottom it constitutes a, a breach of the skin and a possible entry point for the virus, so definitely also category three. These were puncture wounds, I think, inflicted by um, a cat, definitely category three. And then these horrendous uh, facial wounds that you see here, also um, category three. So the same management um, in terms of rabies post exposure prophylaxis applies to these cases. So um, how do we do the risk assessment? So the risk assessment is informed by um, the, the circumstances of the particular exposure event, what type of animal was involved in the exposure, what was the, the, the health or the behavior of this animal, uh, geographically where the um, exposure occurred. We know um, of the prevalence of rabies in different animal species in different geographical areas. So we can use this information to also inform the risk. Also, considering, for example, if this was an, a provoked attack versus an unprovoked attack, obviously an unprovoked attack is where we worry more about rabies. So it's really um, considering the, circumstance, uh, the circumstances of the exposure event that will lead us um, uh, to, to um, or would inform the, the risk assessment uh, process. So the first step of rabies post exposure prophylaxis, very importantly, um, is wound care. Uh, this step should not be underestimated and in communities where dog rabies is prevalent, one should teach um, uh, the public that taking care of, of, of any uh, wounds by thorough washing with just normal water and soap is an important intervention um, for rabies. So here you can see what is recommended through the standard treatment guidelines and essential medicines list of 2020. The wounds are washed, um, as I've mentioned already, thoroughly with soap and water. So once the patient presents uh, to the healthcare facility, um, the wounds need to be washed again. Um, they stayed five to ten minutes, but I think uh, what is important here is that it's it's washed with copious amounts of water and soap. And really, what what we're doing here is to physically remove and inactivate the rabies virus that may be present still at um, at the potential inoculation site. One disinfects the wound, um, and then. Um, Eventually, once uh, rabies immunoglobulin has been applied, one would dress the wound and, and, and uh, follow accordingly. Importantly, really try and delay the suture of any bite wounds. Um, this will affect the application and the absorption of rabies immunoglobulin, um, which is to follow in, for category three exposures. Um, uh, if, if it's uh, required, um, if suturing is required, one, one could do that um, loosely or try and uh, postpone that uh, for as long as possible. Uh, during uh, wind management, one would, of course, also consider um, a booster tetanus vaccination. And you can see the recommendations on the screen there. Also from uh, the um, essential medicines list. Uh, and treatment list. 
And then also, obviously, antibiotic treatment, um, which is recommended in many animal bite cases. So the second step would be to provide rabies vaccinations, and this is for both uh, category 2 and category 3 exposures. In South Africa, there are two registered vaccines. These are uh, imported vaccines. They are both inactivated cell culture vaccines with substantial um, safety and efficacy uh, records used for many years uh, internationally and really uh, efficacious and safe products uh, to use. Um, Verorab uh, is the product that's mostly available in South Africa. Rabipor is also registered, but um, not routinely available, at least uh, currently. Uh, you can see that the vial volumes differ, but each um, uh, for each product, one vial constitutes one dose. The vaccine is administered intramuscularly into the deltoid muscle in adults and the anterior lateral thigh in small children, which we consider to be children under the age of two years. The intramuscular administration of the vaccines are conducted on day zero, three, seven, and then any day between day 14 and day 28 would be the last dose. Um, day zero is considered the first day that, or the, the, the day that the patient presents uh, to the healthcare facility for intervention, regardless of um, the time that might have lapsed between the actual exposure and the presentation to the healthcare facility. So rabies immunoglobulin administration is recommended for all category three exposures. There are two types of immunoglobulin products available in South Africa. Firstly, the human-derived products, which you can see in the table at the top of the screen, and then also equine-derived products, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Now, the, um, you can see that there is a dosage and, and vial volume difference um, for these uh, different products, and then importantly, also different recommended dosage um, for post-exposure prophylaxis. So firstly, the human-derived products, one would use at a dosage of 20 international units per kilogram of body weight, while for the equine-derived product, one would use at a dosage of 40 international units per kilogram of body weight. It's actually, um, one, when one calculates this, actually quite um, a, a, a large um, volume, which, which may be a problem when one has to infuse um, small wounds, but we will talk about that just now. So the rabies immunoglobulin product works best when it's infiltrated into and around um, the wound or wound sites when there are multiple wounds um, present. Uh, previous uh, recommendations uh, guided us to to, to infiltrate in and around the wound site, but that any residual volume um, of, of rabies immunoglobulin would then be administered in the deltoid muscle opposite to uh, the, the deltoid muscle that received the rabies vaccination or, or to receive the, the rabies vaccination. Um, so this is no longer the recommendation. We, we uh, really recommend uh, infiltrate, as, to infiltrate as much of the product into and around uh, the wound or wound uh, sites. This is really where the product would be able um, to perform its function. It serves to neutralize, actively neutralize virus um, that's still present um, in and around uh, the wound uh, site and administering it at a peripheral site uh, does just does not give the same um, uh, the same benefit. Uh, so one might find, uh, following the calculation of the dosage that needs to be applied, that um, you need to open multiple vials uh, of rabies immunoglobulin for the particular case. If um, you've got multiple wounds spread all over the body, obviously you're going to try and reach uh, all of those wounds 
it might be that you also need to dilute um, the product to ensure that you've got coverage in and around all of the um, possible um, routes of entry into the body uh, for the virus. So that's all wound sites. But you may also have, for example, the picture that we had of the, the puncture wounds on the finger, very small wounds um, where you, you're not able to administer um, uh, the, the full dosage that you that you have calculated. In those cases, you would open vial by vial, administer as much as possible, and, um, and then just default the remaining volume. So one applies as, as liberally as possible, but it's recognized that in some cases it, it may cases it may not be possible to administer the full calculated dosage. One should obviously also never exceed um, the calculated dosage, even if there are multiple wounds. As I've mentioned already, we then dilute um, the calculated dosage and apply liberally across um, all wound sites. Uh, on the screen, you can see a, a link uh, to a YouTube video um, with a demonstration of how the infiltration um, of the wounds are um, are addressed. There are some special uh, considerations, um, for example, in immunocompromised patients. So this will include individuals with documented immunodeficiency, such as symptomatic HIV infection or cancer patients. Um, these patients should receive a complete co course of post-exposure prophylaxis, including the administration of rabies immunoglobulin. So this will include um, cases that are category or deemed to be category two exposures uh, for pregnant and breastfeeding women and also for babies and young children. There are no contraindications for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it is considered a life-saving um, intervention since there is no uh, later uh, point of intervention if, if rabies disease develops. So these vaccines do have an established um, safety record and are not considered as a contraindication for these vulnerable uh, groups. In the case of previously rabies vaccinated individuals, in these individuals, rabies immunoglobulin is no longer indicated, even in the case of category three exposures. Um, the administration of two doses of rabies vac uh, vaccines um, is, however, required to boost memory responses, and these vaccines are administered intramuscularly, one dose on day zero and one dose on day three. For um, cases where rabies post-exposure prophylaxis is repeated within a short uh, period of time, uh, we recommend that rabies post-exposure prophylaxis is no longer recommended in the event of an exposure within three months of the completion of post-exposure prophylaxis. If um, there's repeat exposures, but these exposures um, have occurred more than three months apart, uh, the PEP schedule for the previously um, immunized individuals should be followed. And again, this is uh, two doses of rabies vaccine um, uh, given on day zero and day three. Um, in cases of delayed presentation, so this is where um, patients uh, have the exposure and there's a lapse in time before they present for medical intervention. Rabies post-exposure prophylaxis um, is given as a matter of urgency, and the day that the patient presents for medical intervention is considered as day zero. Um, so it should ideally be given um, as soon as possible after the exposure, but when patients present, um, as I've mentioned already, we do give the full rabies post-exposure prophylaxis, regardless of the time that has lapsed. Where wounds have healed, the rig can be infiltrated in and around the historic wound sites, um, as one would do um, for uh, fresh wounds. In individuals at high or continual risk, 
So this may include, uh, for example, veterinarians or laboratorians. So these are people that are at risk because of their occupation. It may also include people that have um, special hobbies that may put them at risk. And it also includes travelers to dark rabies endemic areas, um, and especially when their activities will put them at risk for rabies exposure. And in some of these countries, um, rabies post exposure prophylaxis may not be easily accessible. So then one would also consider these travelers for, for vaccination. So in these cases, we actually provide rabies pre-exposure vaccination, which constitutes one dose of vaccine e um, each on day zero and day seven uh, provided intramuscularly. Um, monitoring of rabies antibody titers over time, especially for um, the persons at high risk, or continual risk, so this is your veterinarians and laboratorians, um, is recommended. When does rabies post exposure prophylaxis fail? Uh, and really, in summary, it, it may fail when these guidelines are not followed. So, when there's deviation to uh, or substantial um, uh, deviation to the proposed schedules and administration guidelines. When rabies immunoglobulin was not applied, but it was indicated, suturing of wounds may interfere with the absorption of rabies immunoglobulin products. Um, not applying rabies immunoglobulin to all wound sites, that, that um, then opens the opportunity for entry into the body for the virus. Applying rabies immunoglobulin or, as a matter of fact, rabies vaccination into the gluteal area. Um, Massive um, and multiple wounds, especially to heads, uh, to the head and shoulders, or any other highly innovated areas such as the hands and the fingers, may lead to shortened incubation periods, um, which then actually just does not give you enough time to um, uh, for for post exposure prophylaxis to take um, full effect. Um, so we've had some of these cases as well where the incubation period of the disease can be as short as two weeks. So just to end off, um, just another opportunity to um, broaden your knowledge on rabies post-exposure rabies post -exposure prophylaxis. Um, on the screen, you can see the link to a publicly available course, which is offered um, free of charge and cover um, uh, all of the aspects that we've discussed here um, tonight in terms of post and free exposure prophylaxis but also um, the issues related to clinical rabies disease in humans. Thank you for your time. So thanks very much, Jackie, and I, I hope uh, everything is sorted out family-wise. So I'm just gonna touch on a couple of points. Um, Mandy, you've gone right past my slides. Go back. No, back, back, back. Okay. So just to highlight something on wound washing, I think it's done very badly. Uh, we do need to uh, inform our communities to, to wash wounds. Any water, soap, soap and water, running water can be used to wash the wound. Um, but at the clinics and hospitals, I think wound washing is not done properly. The aim of it is to try and wash out the virus. So um, start off with soap and water, then 70% alcohol, and it's a good idea to take a syringe and to lavage out the wounds. They're painful, it's not a comfortable procedure, but it's critically important. This is not the time to put some alcohol onto a swab and sort of dab it clean. It's not the time to use hydrogen peroxide or anything that's uh, you know newly been um, introduced for wound care. It's, uh, it's about the physical procedure and it's to use 70% alcohol, lavage, wash well, clean well, get the alcohol into the wounds, and then apply uh, iodine, which is an antiviral agent. Next one, please. Um, just to mention that um, people must not wait, must not submit blood to us to look for rabies antibodies in response to the bite, which uh, they ask uh, when we ask them, why did you do it? They say, well, it needs to inform us if the rabies 
virus was transferred during the exposure, such a test does not exist and you cannot use a blood test to decide whether post-exposure prophylaxis is required. It's purely on the circumstances of the incident. You shouldn't wait for the results in animals. Um, it may take some time and the result from the vet may not reach the human health. And then as Jackie mentioned, I think one of the biggest problems is missed, diag missed diagnosing category three exposures. And here are three examples on the left. The one was a jackal bite in Medicwe Game Reserve. It was an obviously rabid jackal. You can see the bite has um, broken the skin and uh, the uh, game ranger was given only vaccine post-exposure. Fortunately, we're now two years down the line and he's done well. Uh, the one at the bottom was an aardwolf bite in Beaufort West in the Karoo. Again, it's broken the skin and he did not get um, a rig initially and we had to go back um, once we realized that you know, inadequate post-exposure was given um, just several days later. And then the cat bite, you can see the tooth marks. That one is often missed and rabies immunoglobulin is often not given. I think the one on the right, and that's a very famous picture, the very obvious mauling, um, and one is much more likely to give reg in that sort of case. But those small bites, the break in the skin, we've seen rabies cases um, in, in relation to this. Next one, please. In terms of rabies immune globulin, next slide, please. Um, I think Jackie has spoken about the dosage. The technique is not an easy one. You shouldn't use um, vac you shouldn't use a local anesthetic. If there are extensive wounds, you may need to take the patient to theatre, particularly if the wounds are on the face and it's a child. And an insulin syringe should be used. And um, the technique should be as gentle as possible and not multiple ins and outs. The big problem is when there are lesions on the face, the scalp, the lip, the ear, the, um, the eyelid, uh, one is reluctant and it's quite a difficult area to infiltrate. That's the kind of patient you may well need to take to theater. It's critically important that those rather sensitive areas uh, are infiltrated with rig. If rig is not available at the time the patient presents to you, it needs to be obtained as quickly as possible. Vaccine immune response takes eight to 10 days. And it's those critical, that critical time in the first week where the virus is multiplying and has the opportunity to enter the nerve, which is the most vulnerable period. So that is the role of RIG. It immediately neutralizes the virus when it's infiltrated at the site of the bite. Um, and so delays should be avoided. Give the first vaccine, get hold of rig. Uh, it needs to be given as soon as possible. It needs to be given within seven to eight days. After that, the vaccine is, is likely to be effective. And uh, theoretically, you may dampen down the vaccine response if at that stage you give the rig. So they always quote the seven days. It's not a license to wait. Um, it must be given as quickly as possible. And we know that it's difficult to access. Um, most of the big hospitals do have it in rabies endemic areas. Some of the clinics may have, uh, but it's critically important to get hold of it. I think Jackie has spoken about small, large, multiple wounds, wounds on fingers and face, uh, very innovative areas the delays, and actually the biologicals are very safe. The vaccines do contain some antibiotics. We've had some rare allergic reactions, but there are essentially no contraindications uh, to the administration. They are both life-saving biologicals. Uh, next one, Mandy. So just on the risk assessment, um, most animals um, and animal bites are not related to rabies. They are security uh, incidents, uh, or you are in the wrong place um, and the animal uh, is just protecting its territory. Um, they're not rabies incidents. So you absolutely have to do that risk assessment. Be very careful about the history of asking uh, animal vaccination 
uh, previously. Vaccination may be taking place during an outbreak, and you are told that the animal was vaccinated two weeks ago. In an outbreak, the animal may well be incubating rabies at that stage. And uh, you, know, you may think uh, this is a safe exposure, um, but obviously the vaccination was, was too late and uh, this exposure is actually related to, to rabies. So um, I think just be careful about it. It's a piece of the puzzle in the risk assessment. It's certainly not at the top. The risk assessment must be done. Category three exposures are the usual when one is bitten by a rabid dog and most exposures are not related to rabies. We can't be giving rabies biologicals for every exposure since uh, most are just because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I think uh, just two things to pick up on, one thing to pick up on, delays in vaccine schedules. So people may come on day six instead of day three or day nine instead of day seven. Increasing the interval between the vaccines uh, is not such a big issue. Uh, the immune system quite likes a, a delay um, but it doesn't uh, respond well if, if the doses are closer together. So as long as you get the, the wound cleaned, the first rig in, the first two vaccines in, delays after that, you know, just continue the schedule as is. Um, uh, next one, Jackie. I mean, uh, yeah. So pre-exposure prophylaxis, I think Jackie has addressed that. Um, you can use intradermal administration for pre-exposure uh, vaccination. It's a, it's a technique long used, it's a site long used in Southeast Asia. Um, it's dose saving, it's cost saving. I think we just need to get used to it. It's in the WHO guidelines, it's in our guidelines. We've introduced it for pre-exposure. Uh, we have a lot of animal health workers, animal, um, workers who are not vaccinated because of cost issues, you can certainly um, extend the vial to, to cover a number of people. It needs to be under controlled conditions, people who are skilled at intradermal. And so we have allowed it for uh, intradermal uh, pre-exposure, not post-exposure, it's much less controlled. Um, and just remember it's a two-site ID, uh, whereas the intramuscular is one site. Um, for post-exposure prophylaxis for people who've been previously vaccinated, remember you don't give rig, you just need two boosters. The memory for boosting is excellent. And even if it was 15 years ago since you were vaccinated, your immune system will remember and will uh, boost very well when you give the boosters. Uh, routine boosters are now recommended every two years. I think we've been doing three to five. Um, I don't think we absolutely need to check teeters pre-boosting. I think routine boosters um, can be given to those who have continued exposure, like our veterinary colleagues. I think one more slide, Mandy, anything more? Have a look, next one. Okay, so that's... Uh, post-exposure and pre-exposure for humans. I think we're gonna go on to our panel. We don't have lots of time. Let's go to, um, to Vanda, just to mention a little bit about bats. Vanda is from the University of Pretoria. She's a, a world expert on bats. Uh, common uh, that people have bat encounters. When do we need to worry? This is very short, Vanda. Sorry, it's a two to three minutes uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucille, and I will be brief because um, rabies disease from exposure from uh, specifically bats are very rare, but there's a few things that we just have to recognize. So, so there's different viruses in this Lysa virus group that can cause rabies, and you've heard all the talks today, and there we're dealing with rabies virus. So the viruses that we have in the bats are rabies-related viruses, and they can also cause the disease rabies, but they, they're a little bit different. Um, and they specific in South Africa, I'm going to talk about our situation, associated with very specific bat species. And this is this one figure that I'm going to show you. Um, one of them is Lagos bat, associated with the larger fruit-eating bats. And then there's two associated with insect-eating bats. They're much smaller. 
Divanaga virus and Motley bat virus. And Divanaga virus is the slit face bat. There's only one bat in South Africa that's got these long ears with a slit. So it's quite a distinct species. And then Motley is associated with the long fingered bats that lives in caves. So you're really not going to get into contact easily with this bat because they live in caves in certain areas. But what is important with, with um, the long fingered bats and Motley bat virus is that they migrate between some of the caves, for instance, in Limpopo and the Cradle. So certain times of the year, they are, about, they are present in, in areas close to, to urban environments. And then we've got what we call the little brown bats. They're very small. This is like a same size as a matchbox. That's how small they are. And, and I put a question mark here because there's some reports of, of rabies-related viruses in these bats, but, but it's really a question mark. We don't consider these bats to be a real risk of rabies. So it's important in risk assessments to, to take this picture that I'm showing you into account. We've got more than 66 species in South Africa. Not all of them are going to um, transmit rabies or are known to carry these viruses. So we need to take this into account. Then the other point is that we've only had two human deaths, and that's been from Divinoch virus ever in South Africa. So from the others, we've never seen human deaths. And how many bats are infected? So from the studies we do, we think less than 0.1% of bats are infected. So you're really unlucky if you encountered a rabbit bat that can actually transmit the virus to you, and then you develop rabies. It's really rare. The management is the same as for rabies virus, all the things that you've heard today. Transmission is the same, contact of saliva on an open wound. And as Jackie highlighted, we put bats under category three. And that's not because these viruses are more dangerous or anything. It's just because the bites are sometimes so small that people consider it as not an exposure or they don't see it. So we put all real contact with bats under category three exposures, which require RIC and, and vaccine um, to manage it. Um, does the vac vaccines protect? There's all kinds of things in the literature on that they don't protect against some of the diverse rabies-related viruses. What do we know? Every time we gave PEP in South Africa after an exposure, there was no human disease or cases where people died. The two cases where people died was because PEP were not given. So that, that's the bottom line. We handle it the same, and we know that we're going to, in the process, protect people from developing rabies disease. Thank you, Lucille. Thanks very much, um, Wanda. And, and bats are much maligned creatures. They really have an important role in our um, ecosystem. So um, the, the bats are difficult to see. You may miss them. Um, it's it, The other kind of bite that's difficult to manage is an expert, not a bite, is the exposure is a mucosal exposure. Saliva from an animal um, onto a um, mucosal surface like conjunctiva or onto the mucosal surface of a mouse, we don't know what to do with those. So what they have done in, in India with some success, I, you know, I don't think we've studied this well, is to wash out the eye uh, if it's immediate uh, with some rig, some diluted rig. But you know, I think that's still under study. So thanks very much. Um, then just to mention in uh, Gauteng, uh, we do have the state vets here. If you do have a problem animal, uh, you do want some, some advice or somebody to go out and check the animal. These are the Gauteng contact numbers for state vets. Uh, all provinces have state vets um, and they, they've really been fantastic in, in supporting um, our, our response to, to uh, post-exposure and, and incidents. The last word goes to uh, Claude, just to mention uh, what you do in your laboratory and uh, perhaps one or two words about the uh, jackal um, cycle uh, in, in the cradle. So sorry, you've only got two minutes. Um, I think you are there, but perhaps you can just share some experiences with us. Claude? Yes, yeah. thanks, Thank Lucille. Mandy, could you just upload my, my presentation, please? Claude, I'm gonna have to find it. Uh, I didn't okay, have time. Okay. It uh, only you know came through. Yeah, the most recent can... one. If you can just wait for me in two seconds. Sure. Uh, but just 
to get the, uh, the, the talk going. Thanks Lucero, for this invitation. I think from the lab side, what we're trying to do is one, once we receive a specimen, we're just trying to exclude, we're just trying to show their presence or absence of the antigen. And if the antigen is present, uh, obviously PEP or other medical inter interventions can be taken. And then the next step that we go on to is to say, what is the biotype of that, uh, uh, you know, antigen? You know, the previous pre presenter has talked about uh, a number of uh, list of viruses from bats. And then finally, we also want to establish what is the origin uh, of that particular antigen. So whilst we are waiting for the uploading. There you go, uh, Claude. Okay. It should Thank be up you. and running. Sure, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. The next one, please. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. So, okay. so num number one, please. Number one, just go back. Okay, so. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, the first one. So the first question is, when you get a specimen, uh, is there presence or absence of lisa virus antigen? And we know we have 17 lisa virus species in this genus. So when I looked at the JACO, uh, the submissions that came with the JACO uh, specimens, most of them, either most of the JACOs have been found dead or they were just found wandering, you know, next to human uh, holdings uh, or it had been in, interacted with uh, house dogs. But our primary diagnosis uses um, a labeled antibody and then if there is an antigen in the brain specimen or central nervous specimen, we'll be able to see this um, uh, apple green fluorescence. So from that data, we can then, then plot, you can see on the right, the red dots just shows you uh, the presence of positive JAPO rabies cases over a certain period from 2012 to 2017, mainly from Limpopo in the Northwest. Uh, we can go on to the next one. Next slide. So the next question will be, what is the biotype? So we are using a tool that is called MAB typing. And you can see the, the last two columns, uh, the reactivity of the Jaco rabies virus, as well as the dog rabies virus, they're very similar. So what it essentially shows us is that there's very ease of exchange between these two host species. In actual fact, uh, rabies viruses from dogs and jackals are very closely related. And we, have, we can show this by MAB typing, as in the table above, and also by genetic sequencing on the uh, figure just uh, to the right, which shows that there are about 97%, at least 97% sequence uh, identity. So what we have also, seen in South Africa is that black bed jackals are capable of sustaining rabies cycles independently of domestic dogs. And if we look more closely on the diagram on the right, um, I'm not sure, it's not very really clear, uh, but what it shows here, this particular clade number one shows viruses from the rabies outbreak in 2016, but also shows uh, viruses from an outbreak in uh, KwaZulu Natal in 2012. There are also other incidental hosts there, like the bovine and the dogs. And what it tells us is that uh, it could be possible that the outbreak that happened in Jaco rabies in KwaZulu Natal is linked directly to, to that in the Northwest. Obviously, we may need to discuss this, Kevin, uh, to see how, you know, reliable or how conclusive this can be. But in summary, what it shows is that um, there is spillover of infection from jackals to other host species, but also in certain circumstances, you see that uh, jackals maintain their own cycles independent of other host species. I think that's all that I have uh, for this presentation. Thank you. 
So thanks very much, Claude. Um, yeah, I think it's been a fantastic uh, webinar and let me thank all, all the speakers. I, I really wanna recognize rabies as the epitome of a one health approach. We absolutely have to work together um, to, to combat this disease. We need to save lives by addressing both sides. And I think we need to recognize the important members of the team. At the core of rabies control are our animal health technicians who do a fantastic job um, of, of, of vaccinating um, uh, of the dogs. They have their ears and their eyes to the ground. They know what's happening out there. And um, I, I really want to recognize their, their superb work. And actually, Kevin, Kevin is an animal health technician, um, but I know there are a number on, on, the, uh, on the webinar uh, this evening, and I'd like to recognize their outstanding work in contributing to rabies control. So Mandy, I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, if there are any additional questions, please post them. We'll try and answer them. Please uh, access all the different websites. Um, we're at the start of this outbreak. Uh, we're going to work, have to work really hard to control it. Um, and hopefully um, we won't lose many more animal lives and human lives. And uh, it remains for me to thank all of you uh, for joining tonight. Uh, special thanks to the speakers. Thanks to Mandy and her team for hosting this webinar and to all of you for attending. Um, and I think that brings me to the end of what I have to say. Um, Thank COVID you very is, much. Yeah, COVID is, is uh, what we're mostly dealing with. Let's not let rabies slip through. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who've uh, posed questions. I will forward them to Prof Bloomberg or to the right people. And uh, hopefully we, if you've registered and your email address is on your registration, we'll be able to uh, uh, send you those CPD, those, uh, give you those answers. Then uh, with regards to CPDs and the vets, I um, only applied for HPCSA. I believe I can apply for a veterinary CPD. I will find out uh, from uh, Katya or someone how we can do it um, and then I will try and get that recognized as, as CPD for you. Um, there's really um, most of the questions were answered. I see this how long after prophylaxis. Uh, share the webinar recording. It will be shared. It will be on NetCare YouTube. If you type in NetCare YouTube, the entire video and presentation will be on NetCare YouTube. Um, sorry, we can't take your questions, but um, happy that if you email them to me, you did get my email address. We'll make sure that every single one is answered. To the speakers, uh, uh, wonderful, not easy to put a, a, a seminar like this together, um, but every single one of you was wonderful. And if you've got any concerns with the sharing of your presentations, please let me know. Otherwise, they will all be shared as one presentation. Thank you, Lucille. Um, I'm sure we'll do this again in the next couple of weeks. Thanks very much. And thank you all for your excellent work in controlling and responding to rabies. Okay. Thank you. And, and uh, yeah, good evening. Thanks, Lucille. Thanks, Claude. I'm Thank sorry you. I didn't know about your update, your upload. I apologize. No problem. No problem. <laughs>